Um, we are going to kick this thing off. We have Revit hacks, tips, and tricks today. Some of these you may know exist. Some of them you don't. We're hoping. We're hoping you get some kind of enlightenment. Um, Revit kind of gets a bad rap um, a lot of times for not having the most efficient workflows, and sometimes there are bottlenecks and challenges that creep up on that. And so today we have um, primarily Revit examples. Now, we do a lot of stuff with Dynamo, um, a lot of stuff on the Dynamo membership. We have stuff on the blog. Yep. Um, Mark has talked about Dynamo for construction. Mac has talked about Dynamo for packing algorithms. Oh, yep. um, and that is bending the rules of Revit, as we say. So, But for today, we are primarily going to be looking at Revit hacks, tips, and tricks. So it's going to be Revit-centric. Um, so... Real quick, for those that don't know, um, the team is this handsome crew. Um, we have Sean, who is our MEP master of Fruin. Uh, Mac, Data is the new Black Little. Mark, our mad scientist, Mendez. Daniel, Maestro de Illumination. Cortez. Illumination. Illumi thank you. Yeah. Like that. Do you have a Spanish background? Me? No, yeah. Daniel does, though. You, okay. Yeah, I don't. But you said it really well. Thank you. Yeah, you know, yeah, I've been practicing. You've been so. practicing? Mm -hmm. Okay, I like it. Um, Daniel, who's not related to Bill Allen, Allen, Bill, Big Ballin. So, by the way, I don't refer to myself as Big Ballin. Let's just be clear about this. He, um, does, he does sometimes. <laughs> He's trying to be modest right now. He absolutely refers to himself as Big Ballin. So. so, the story behind this is every place I've ever worked at, it's always been B. Allen, first initial, last name, and therefore has always been Ballin. And therefore, I, over the years, have picked up this nickname as Ballin. So, Mac thought it would be cute to put it in this slide, so that's why that's there. Um, Corey, I love Slack Green. <laughs> so, Corey, we use Slack in our office, and Corey loves Slack, and we like to poke a little bit. Corey just came from, a uh, big shout-out to Corey, just came from uh, WeWork that was recently acquired by Case. He was at the Case office. He's one of our new senior design technologists, so big shout-out to Corey Green. Um, he just joined the team, and we're super, super excited about that. So... Um, why do we do what we do? We believe in disrupting the current processes that are in place in architecture, engineering, and construction by creating a better way to design and build buildings. That's basically our jam. That's why we, why we do what we do. And we also believe there's an untapped opportunity for you guys to automate your processes by using computational design and building information management. Um, this is shout out to uh, Buck over at Binbox. Um, he is the official Evolve Lab bouncer we've decided in the office. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. There's some great stories. If you guys don't know Buck, um, ask him ask him some some stories of his past. I won't I won't mention anything, but just say, hey man, what's your background? Where did you work? And, and ask him some things like that. He's a tough dude. Um, but they're representing with Binbox. Um, we're doing a lot of things with Binbox. Daniel over here on the left was out there at Built. Shout out to Built for last week. Oop. That was good. And so Daniel was out there presenting one of his classes. Um, you can get the skinny on that. I think we're going to do a blog on that next week. Yeah, look for that next week. So that'll be good. Um, so big shout out to the crew at Bimbox. That's them. Um, we author. What do we do? You want to tell people what we do? What do we do at Evolve Lab? We do, I'd say, just about anything that involves technology in the AAC industry. Um, we do everything from helping some companies get out of AutoCAD and into Revit and using BIM more efficiently. That can be anything from... Revit training to template creation, content creation, and then on the other end, we kind of do a lot of uh, task automation, computational design, generative design. Um, pretty much any way we can make your workflow more efficient, we can do it. Do so you do babysitting? Um, for Car the right washes. price. Oh, yeah. Car washes? Oh, yeah. They're expensive, but we'll do it. Okay. We'll do it. Okay. So just yeah. give us a call. That's right. We have to fund our passion somehow, mm -hmm. and that's through car washes. So yeah, that's really our so cash that. flow for yeah. all this is just car washes. Uh, Mac's actually out there right now. I think he <laughs> has his cheerleading outfit on trying to get some people over. So hopefully we'll be in business for another month. We'll yeah. See. yeah, we'll see. So if you guys don't see us next month, the car wash business didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. So... Um, so what does this look like? What is car washing now? What is, what is computational design? What are we doing at Evolve Labs? So you guys saw some of this in the poor intro, and we had some audio issues, but for those just joining, we do uh, some computational design. We do some interoperability. This is Grasshopper to Revit. Um, we do some parametric modeling, scripting, optimization, a lot of fun stuff, um, but we also do a lot of uh, kind of bread and butter, template creation, content creation, trainings, workshops, things like that. Um, this is an example of kind of optimizing some facades. 
um, different projects that we've worked on. Um, check it out. It's fun stuff. This is this is what we do. We enjoy it. Yeah. There's nothing better in life than what we're doing right now. It's a lot of fun. So, um, But you guys have come to talk about Revit hacks, tips, and tricks. That's why you're here. Um, and Mac, or excuse me, Mac, I called you Mac. I apologize. I'll just leave. <laughs> I got distracted with the car wash and Mac out in the parking lot. <laughs> Um, in a cheerleading outfit. So Danny is going to be our MC. He's going to be fielding what, questions what? from you guys. Um, so keep the chat window going. We want a lot of action in there. Uh, a lot of these things can be boring. We don't like boring. We want a lot of interaction. We don't want you guys dozing off, eating food, checking Facebook. You can do that stuff, but you have to be giving a shout out for us while you're doing it. Yep. You have to capture something, and then you can be on social media. That's the rule. Yep. Okay, but we really don't have any way to, to check if they're doing that. No no, 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 no. There's no quality control or, or way that we can look at their IP address or anything like that to check up on them. Uh, not that I'm willing to share right now. Okay, so. very good. I like it. So keep the chat window going. Um, we want to hear a lot of noise and chatter in there. Um, if you guys have questions at any point, if you are trolling us, we may kick you out. Just fair warning on that. <laughs> but um, if you have any questions, legitimate questions, um, we, you can give us a hard time. That's all good. We like that. Um, you will disagree with some of these workflows. Some of these are not industry best practices. That's why they are hacks. Um, but they are ways to bend the rules of Revit. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So without further ado, do you have anything else? Nope. We can jump right in? Nope. I will let you know when the finger or the fingers. I just saw Neil Stir just said cross your fingers. So yeah, good luck. When the fingers start coming <laughs> in, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right, sounds good. And the questions as well. I like it. So first one, we posted this, and this is... Um, Something I came across maybe six or seven years ago in Revit, and I was like, oh, that is a cool idea. Um, so the challenge we have a lot of times with is like Revit railings. They're not great, and they're not intuitive. Like this mess of like balusters and rails and all of this information can sometimes be uh, confusing. Um, mostly they work if you do like a solid extrusion, like a normal kind of guardrail um, handrail solution. But these panel conditions aren't great. Now, this is awesome. The thing I like about this example specifically, I literally downloaded it last night, by the way, um, is that this is straight from Autodesk. So, like, these are part of the Autodesk sample library. And I think I actually, I'm, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, I'm going to open this. We have, uh, you can grab these handrail, stairs, railings, stringers, etc. cetera. Um, they're kind of like this resource file for Revit stairs and railings. And so we have this panelized guardrail system. And the thing that I love is like I literally downloaded this directly from the website. And Autodesk is great. Revit's great. I'm not bashing them, kind of bashing them. Is that we have this guardrail and it doesn't fill in these panels. And so like you have these conditions where it's very cumbersome, even like with content that's given us given to us directly out of the box, it doesn't work. Um, and so this is sometimes a challenge. So I found this one workflow. And I'll show you this uh, not working in the project. Um, I'm getting too many windows open now. All right, so here we have this in a real project. Um, and you can see the, the, the voids or the openings in here just like they were in the sample file. Um, and so what you can do is you can do this workflow of modeling guardrails, these panels, as curtain wall. Now, before you guys start stoning and shaming me, Yes, I recognize like that you can't schedule them. Yes, there's category issues when you bring it into Navisworks. Yes, there's all these other issues that happen downstream. I recognize that. Um, but if you if your deliverable is, is simply and man, are we going to open up a can of worms here? If your deliverable is simply just a permit set and you're printing and there's no data handoff um, to a contractor or to an owner, in my opinion, this workflow is okay. So. The, the, what you do is, is you have a, a curtain wall, a fake curtain wall. It's a real curtain wall, but it's really we're using it as a guardrail. And the glorious thing that I really like about this workflow is that if you ever want to add a baluster, like anywhere in this like assembly, I can just go to that curtain grid um, button right up here, and I can add these curtain grids. I can also you know remove them. Um, but what's really nice is that you can see like it infills the panel. You don't have this issue that you do with these out-of-the-box panel assemblies. Now, this workflow is usually only good um, for kind of this glass rail condition. There's another um, workflow that I use sometimes of using an adaptive component, and I don't have that 
pre-baked ready to show you guys, but you could use an adaptive component if you're really dogmatic about having a real Revit railing, you could use an adaptive component and place like some panel infills in here. So that is a workflow that you could use as a side, but this is one way to start using the curtain wall as a panelized guardrail. Um, some things to note is that you do have to consider the angle. So like this bottom rail here is actually, you know, would typically be a horizontal uh, element, but I've actually uh, have put in this angle in here. So that way, if we put any more gr curtain grids in this way, it follows that slope. And so you have to be aware of that is that that angle um, condition. So I would love to know, if, is there any comments, questions, shaming going on in the chat room? Are people frustrated with this workflow? Do I have to leave yet? Right now, I think the biggest question is where do they get the hat you're wearing? The hat? Yeah. Oh, man. I tell you what, um, if you guys can publish some cool stuff on social media and I catch it, I will totally pitch you guys a hat. You guys give us a shout out. You have a hat coming. And by the way, the hat is out of necessity. I have this uh, condition. They call it male pattern baldness. And so this is actually um, a real uh, a real concern of mine. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that big of a deal. It's really just to keep the glare from the lights off you, my head. You rocked the bald, though. Well, yeah, I appreciate and, that. And the cap. I appreciate that. Um, we do have one actual question about uh, the railing. Um, have you tried creating railing as segments? One part for slope and one part for uh, straight stairs. Yes, yeah, railings uh, by segment is a great workflow. Um, there's also um, quite a few advances in the railing tool, which in and of themselves are pretty awesome. Um, they've now given you the ability to change in conditions. Um, what the user's talking about is, you know, editing the path. Uh, by the way, I don't want to call him user. Who is that? Can we get a, a name? That is, I would say, Score DX. Score DX. I like it. Birth Best certificate. Guess. I think that's um, it's probably on his birth certificate. Score DX. Yeah. Okay, definitely. Um, so you can do a split segment and use that for your different conditions. Um, you still will run into the challenge of the panels not cleaning up uh, very well. So. Uh, take that for what it's worth, but yes, you could do that. Okay? Excellent. All right, if we're good, we'll keep on trucking. Um, so the other workflow... What about handrails? Do you um, apply a similar... Good question. Yeah, you could do a similar workflow uh, for handrails. If you are just doing a handrail, I think I would just augment this with a Revit handrail. Um, you could... Let me think about that. You could have a horizontal profile in your curtain wall, and you do have the ability to offset some of this information, the profiles. You could do that, um, but I think I would maybe just use the handrail tool. I think it would be m much more difficult to kind of control that um, using the curtain wall, having the offsets. Um, but to each their own, you know? Like, like I, by the way, I'm going to get my soapbox for just a second. Go for it. Okay. So I just I had a conversation with uh, a friend of mine over beers this week, and we were talking about how people see things black and white. And things are not black and white in Revit. Um, people get very emotionally attached to their workflows. And they will say, this is the way you need to do it. And I always say there's 27 different ways to do it. And there are pros to a approach or cons to another approach. And so to each their own. Like if you want to use a handrail, use a handrail. If you don't, use a curtain wall. Um, to each their own, just know the shortcomings, know the issues that we talked about. There's scheduling issues, there's coordination issues that come up. Um, so there are cons, like no workflow is perfect unless it's my workflow. Then that workflow is the one that is perfect. I'm just kidding, kind of. So um, to each their own, though, like weigh the pros and cons and consider that um, as you're thinking about different ways to attack or use Revit. So good? I think we're all good here. All right, sweet. Okay, so another one that I like a lot, um, this is pretty cool. Um, maybe you guys will be like, oh yeah, I already know about this. Many of you I think might not. Um, so you typically have these, these elevation um, symbols that exist in Revit, and then you also have um, your window tags that exist. Let me get to here, I believe, this view, yes. Okay, so we have these window tags that exist. And so if I have these guys, they're just like normal window tags. Um, so these are kind of the, the graphics that come out of the box here. And so you can tag windows, as everybody knows, by the way, keyboard shortcuts, use your keyboard shortcuts. Um, KS will get you to your key keyboard shortcuts. Um, so if anyone doesn't know, KS, you can customize these things. They're per your machine. 
uh, you have to transfer them from Revit to version to Revit version, but those exist, keyboard shortcuts. Um, so tagging windows. I totally rabbit hole side trail that thing, but it's all good. Okay, so window tags. You can tag windows, and in here, what I have done is I have developed an elevation marker. Do you see this elevation marker? I've created one just for curtain wall. So like say that you want to elevate this guy, but you want it to look like a window tag. So what I've done is I dropped in this just by going to elevation and then picking on curtain wall. And then I can drop in this elevation, but it looks like a window tag. Additionally, further what I've done is I have in here assigned a view template and that view template, many of you guys are used to this workflow, is where everything in that view is turned off except the curtain wall. And so that way, if we go to that view, it's actually just the curtain wall itself. And then you can go ahead you know, and, and dimension to your heart's content on top of that thing. And so in here, this is a workflow of not having two separate, I the control tab back, backwards to me in 2019, not understanding why I can't go back to my previous view. But um, in here, you have this elevation that looks like a tag. And so that mitigates the need for having a tag and an elevation marker. Furthermore, um, as you drop it onto a sheet, uh, which I have, um, in here, you have this. And as you change this on your sheet, this is the win. Um, we do that. And then if we go back to our floor plan, you can see this is updating. So this is the curtain wall elevation hack. So um, for those that didn't know that, that's one. Do we have any thoughts, comments on that? So we do have one question here. Um, how do you transfer KS? Keyboard shortcuts. Keyboard how do you transfer shortcuts? How do you transfer keyboard shortcuts? You have to load them in. So you do KS and then you have to um, import them. And then so you use the import tool, you go grab it. Um, before, I should back up, I explained this sequentially wrong. First you export them from a previous version, then you import them into your new version using the export and import uh, tools. Um, if you want to standardize this at your firm, you drop it in somewhere on the server, um, import it onto everybody's machine. So that's the keyboard shortcut import export utility. All right. I got another question about the stairs. Um, going back to that really quickly. Yep. Um, is there a way you can specify that the first five treads are going to be carpet material and the rest wood? I don't think so. There so, you go. Yeah, it's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's a pointing answer. Yeah, because there are, there are systems. I think what you could do is you could paint. Um, let's try it. Uh, you probably could paint the treads, um, but I don't think you can like assign them because they work as like an entire assembly. Um, so like if you go to the paint tool and let's paint them parking stripe yellow. So you could do that where you could paint them and then so you have, you know, different tread uh, paint, it's the surface. There's no thickness to it, similar to painting, you know, brick on any kind of a surface. There's no surface, you're just kind of painting it even though it looks like brick. Um, but yeah, that's one way you could do that. And look, it even applied it to the top one. That's cool. I didn't know it would do that. Oh, so because this is a uh, multi-level stair, it looks like the paint applies to the one above. I would not expect that, but it did that. So that's cool. Excellent. Yeah. I um, have another question going back. Uh, could you show the components that make up the elevation family? Sure. Um, let me close this guy. And... So the components that make up the curtain wall family, uh, or excuse me, curtain wall elevation family, it's just an elevation marker. Um, and then what we've done is change uh, the graphics uh, to look like a um, to look like a tag. So there's really nothing special going on here. Uh, it's just a label. Um, so you have your detail number, um, and then you have your your graphics that exist in here. Um, so that's it. There's uh, these little well, I guess that's not it. We do have this kind of nested um, invisible family that exists um, in there that you can use, but that's pretty much it. So Excellent. And uh, Elvis would like to know, is there a default shortcut for regions? Filled regions? Filled I'm, regions? I'm guessing. Um, we'll assume for now. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but what I always do is I do the search, and then I say filled, and there they are. So we could assign one as long as it doesn't exist. 
Um, it does already exist. To find replace, uh, let's see if maybe we do RR. Nope. FF. I think that one's taken. Oh, no, it's not. OK. Um, so then that, and then we do FF, and now we are in the filled region command. So yeah, looks like there is. You've got to create it, but you can do a, a keyboard shortcut for filled region. So. All right. Cool. Good to keep trucking? Yep. All right. I like it. Um, OK. Oh, man, this is my favorite. All right. So I'm a little partial to this. Um, this is another one that people will judge you for. Um, but I think it's a good workflow. I like it, especially if you're not doing massive, massive projects. OK. So I, I'm not the first one to come up with this, but I stumbled upon this a long time ago, like 10 years ago. Many of you guys are going to go, I know about this. Some of you guys are going to go, what? You can do that in Revit? Um, so basically, think about how you normally detail. Um, and there's this whole discussion. Corey and I just had this whole conversation on detailing the other day. Uh, live, uh, live sections, live details, not live um, f uh, drafting views. Um, there's all kinds of hybrids of those. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, general building details as drafting views. And then uh, if you have things that need coordinated um, on a per instance basis, those are like a live section you do in Revit. And then you can drop in like a detail component. I don't know if any are loaded in here. Uh, there are. So we have some detail components. And then so like you can drop in, you know, structurally you probably want to coordinate with your engineer, just link that in. But you can have all these detail components that you can kind of layer on top. Now, the problem with this is that if you do that same workflow for say like this curtain wall and you drop in like the little profile in the graphic of it, um, when this curtain wall element changes, you know, this stuff doesn't go along for the ride unless you lock it. Maybe if you line lock it, it might, it might even still yell at us though. Let's see. It's yelling at me already, I haven't even done anything. No, I can't align it to that. Um, so maybe you can't even, let's see, maybe this guy. Let's see. Okay, so we'll lock this, and we move this. This should go, yeah. So you can line lock this. This goes along for the right. So that's one way you could do that. Or this really sweet workflow I like personally is you can nest a detail component into this mullion so that if I change this to fine, and I'll show you guys how this works in a second, um, we have this detail component that exists inside the curtain wall. And so like as I move the mullion, it's not only moving in 3D in my section, in my elevations, but it's also updating my detail component, which is nested inside the curtain wall. Now this has all kinds of other applications too, uh, one of which that I like a lot is where you can nest fireproofing into your structural engineer's model. Um, some engineers aren't super jazzed about that, some are more than happy to do it, but you could also nest fireproofing into the structural members. Um, cut a section and it will automatically show the fireproofing uh, around that structural member. So that's another um, way to apply this workflow. So I'm going to open this up um, while I do that. Do we have any questions that are coming in? Yeah, one question. Um, is it possible to schedule a curtain wall based on size and grid types? Size and grid types. You can schedule walls in the curtain wall itself. Um, you can schedule the panels and the mullions within that. Um, and you can schedule, you know, the overall assembly, but not like, not as I think that they're asking, like as, uh, can I get, you know, four feet on center, then two feet, and then four feet on center, then two feet. Um, if you change that system, I do not believe that you can schedule those kind of like instant uh, dimensional locations. Okay. And then one more question. Are we going to be covering any ticks and trips uh, for MEP systems today? Um, yeah, I have a few. They're not going to be MEP centric, but they transcend across uh, platforms or excuse me, across disciplines. So I'm, I have three or four examples that if you're an MEP person uh, or a structural engineer, uh, you should, like I said, uh, uh, and this goes for everybody, like some people know about this, like some people know about this workflow, uh, many do not. Um, there's a few others that people will be like, cool, that applies to me or that doesn't apply to me. But there should be a few examples in here uh, that structural engineers and MEP professionals can take to the bank. Excellent. Okay. Trying to make it worth your time. All right. So this is a profile family. So like I just um, edited the profile and it's a specifically um, like a curtain wall profile family. And what I've done is I just nested this detail component inside of here. And what's nice about this is I have these like different sizes. 
And you can see, like, as I change it, it grows. And I've even, like, I've modeled uh, the backer rod and sealant um, in here. Um, so in here, it actually blocks it out. I don't have it um, as a detail component, but it is blocking out. So you get that actual, like, rough opening when you drop it in. Um, and also able to kind of, like, swap these out for different sizes and types. And really quick, how do you nest the detail component? Um, it's just a insert load family, um, just as similar to how you nest any other uh, family. You just bring it in as a uh, loaded family, and then it nests it within here. Um, is how you do it. Okay. And are you able to tag the detail item inside of the mulling? Really good question. I would say normally yes, but I don't think so in this condition. Um, for those that don't know, if you have a component as shared, you can tag and schedule it. Um, in the Revit environment, and well, let's we'll test it here. Um, I'm always a big fan of testing this stuff, even when it's on the fly. So if we say shared, it's not set to shared right now. Um, and then I load this into my curtain wall uh, profile, and I'll overwrite that. So now it's shared. Um, maybe I can't. I think I might not be able to. Um, normally you can, but because it's a system family, I don't think so. Um, that's what my gut's telling me. Um, let's just try it though. So in here, if we tag this bad boy, we can tag, um, and I probably don't have any tags loaded in for these. And it's been kind of goofy anyway, so I would say no. Um, I don't know if it's worth looking into, but I would say I don't think so. I think you have to tag the mullion as a whole, only because it's a system family. Okay, any other questions or thoughts on that one? I think we are good for that. Okay, sweet. Thanks for the questions, guys. Keep the chat going. I like it. Uh, one more. The detail yeah. component. That's a parametric family, and that's what allows you to uh, change the size of the mullion in there. Correct. That correct. That's correct. Yep. Right. Yeah, it's it's parametric. Um, and so if you go in here, it has these parameters. And if anybody's looking to learn more about families, um, I did a session called... Um, Oh, what did I call it? It was uh, it was about rabbit families, and the analogy is bones, muscle, skin. So I get super sidetracked, but reference planes are bones, parameters are the muscle, the form is the skin. Um, we have, uh, I think it's like best practices for building rabbit families or something like that. Um, check out our blog. I think it's on YouTube too. Um, and I go through on how to build these kind of parametric components so you can have that at your disposal. For those that don't know, like, too, like, please subscribe. Like, if this, like, content brings you guys any kind of value or a little warm and fuzzy, um, it's awesome to subscribe because next time we do a session on families or we have a new, um, a new video come out, you guys get notified of that. So if you guys enjoy the content and you like it, I believe you can even, like, right now hit subscribe. Um, can you do it? I think it's in there. Um, you should be able to subscribe to our channel. Maybe wait till the video is done. But please, please subscribe if you if it brings you any kind of value. Um, all right, so I'm gonna get out of this. Um, one more question about that, uh, Mr. Dale Sanders. Yep. Hey, Dale. Hi, Dale. Former coworker of mine. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> question: now, Are you adding a label parameter to assign the right detail to the right mullion size? A label to the detail component for the detail to have the association or the right size. I, I think he's talking about like in the family itself and like so that you can create that association. Um, I believe what I did, I don't even know what I did, it's been so long. I created these different types, I have different depths associated to that and as you change the value or this guy, it updates um, the uh, constraint for it. So. I believe that's how that's working, um, but the, there's not a there's not a label like I was kind of halfway expecting like a nested one in here, but no, there's not a, a label. Um, it's just constrained, I think, to the dimensions and these uh, these more importantly these profile lines on the outside. So it's a good question. Hopefully, I answered that. Poor, I, I think I answered it poorly, but hopefully that's answered. Um, so that is so. Those are a few um, hacks with curtain wall. So do we have any other questions or thoughts or comments? I'm gonna keep trucking. Um, I do have one from Matthew. How do you handle the sealant joint with the detail component and mullion profiles? Yeah, so that um, you can just either drop in another detail component in that curtain wall family, um, or that, mullion, that profile family, excuse me. Uh, you can do that. Uh, otherwise, you can also uh, just drop it in as a detail component. So either of those two workflows should work uh, just dropping that in so 
Good questions. All right. Um, we have a lot of content, so I'm going to keep going if that's okay. Um, I know you guys keep filling in the questions. I'll try to answer them, but I want to. Um, we're about halfway through, and I want to make sure because there's some other really sweet examples I want to show you guys. All right. So another example that I wanted to show is this. Uh, okay. So this workflow I've coined the Parameter Jammer workflow. Okay. Um, trademark, copyright. So um, Parameter Jammer workflow basically is you have a bunch of parameters that you do not want in your template, okay? There's like, it does, like these parameters don't apply to every project, they're only specific project types. Um, for this workflow specifically, I did it, it, the context was like a room data schedule. So if you, for those that aren't familiar, room data schedule basically cap captures a bunch of data around a room, printed on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper typically, um, and it has all this information. Well, you have all of these parameters in here that I have put in my parameter jammer resource file. Um, and you can call them container files. They're just, it's a separate project and it can house these schedules. Now, I am sorry to say that I only stumbled onto this workflow. I found this out, well, it, maybe five years ago. And I've been using Revit a really, really, really long time. And I found this workflow um, that basically you can copy paste a schedule and all the parameters come over. Now, some of you guys are going, what? You can do that, like the parameters come over? Because if many of you guys are used to this very tedious process of when you want to add a project, making it a shared parameter, adding a shared parameter, selecting the parameter, hitting OK, like you have 57,000 different checkboxes uh, to pick. And I said that correctly, like you don't need always, like people always ask, like when do you make it a project parameter or a shared parameter? They have these nice little tips right here project parameter can appear in schedules but not tag so if you don't need to tag it many times it can be um, just a project parameter if it's something that needs to transfer across a bunch of families um, needs to be tagged then it's a shared parameter so don't overuse the shared parameters use this workflow to get parameters from one location to another if they don't need to be tagged and the content or the, the data doesn't need to exist in the family itself so those are those are the caveats now to show you how this works um, I honestly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it. Like I, I am such a nerd when it comes to this. I can't even explain how much of a nerd I am. Okay, so in here, if we look, I have this data group, and there is a limited amount of parameters here. Let me pull this out so you guys know I'm not blowing smoke up your butt. Just said butt in a professional webinar. <laughs> our numbers are falling quickly. <laughs> Calling HR now. All right, so identity data. Um, here is all of, but here is all of the parameters. And you can see they're a minimal amount of parameters, but I'm gonna keep doing it. Very immature. Um, in here, I have a separate project. Um, I have this schedule, room data schedule. And I'm going to control C this bad boy and I'm going to go back to my project and I want to show you guys here like in my schedule just so you know I'm not messing with you all right there is no room data schedule in here and when I control V this bad boy it comes over there's my room data schedule okay look at all these glorious parameters now more importantly more importantly if we go to the floor plan and we pick on this room Oh, look at this glorious data. Okay, so here is all these parameters that did not exist uh, previously. And so I've just brought over all these parameters. I can say my awesome parameter value, right? So whatever you want, make it your own here. So you can actually bring these parameters across from project to project simply by creating a schedule that houses these as in this example, like a room data schedule. Um, bringing that over. So you can bring schedules over that way, you can bring parameters over that way. Um, the data lives in the project on the, in this example. Um, so the data stays there in a sense. Um, but that's how it works. So with that, I've been talking a lot. Is there some questions, some feedback? Um, Are your minds, like I, if it's not, my mind is blown right now, like it's not an appropriate answer in my opinion. Like I, this is- some positive feedback. Some I don't, positive no feedback. one has, no it doesn't look like any minds have been officially blown yet. Okay. Um, but it gets messy when that happens. It, so right now we don't have any additional questions on this. Okay. So. Cool. This seriously blew my mind. Like I stumbled on this five years ago, and I, like I said, been using Revit a long time ago, long time, 
and I was like, what just happened? This is awesome, um, hands down. So, but I'm kind of a data nerd. All right, we do have one question from Margarita. Okay. Uh, have you run into a situation where a parameter exists in a schedule but not in the project? So there's no way to fill it out? When yes. does this happen? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so when that happens, it is a shared parameter. And what has happened is someone has brought in a piece of content, but they have not added the shared parameter to their project. So the process for that is if you have a parameter and you can't edit that darn thing, it is because it's a shared parameter and it has not been loaded in the project. So you go to your project parameters, shared parameter, select it, add it, hit OK, assign what category you want it to. That is when that uh, condition um, exists. So. All right. And there is some discussion over the jammer part. Yes. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? What exactly does the, the jammer refer to? It just is a fun way for me to say I'm copy pasting parameters from one project to another. So I'm jamming those parameters from one file like stuffing into... Stuffing into a thing, so not like rocking out. Exactly. Okay. That's right. Debate cell. So, yeah. It's good. Excellent. Okay. Keep on trucking. Um, let's see. Yeah, keep going for now. I'll come back if I find some more questions. Okay, I like it. All right. Now, I did, I don't know if you guys are doing residential, if you're doing big commercial projects. My background is big, um, big commercial projects. And I did a lot of stuff with space programming. And one of the things was is to start calculating like program area versus actual area, finding differences, departments, sub-departments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very boring stuff. Um, but I like it for some reason. So in here, what I have is I've created a program area parameter, which is just an area parameter, an actual area, and then an area difference parameter. And so I don't know. Let me see. Let me blow this up because you guys probably, when it gets into schedules, I always know people have a hard time seeing this stuff, especially if you're like watching on a projector or something in a conference room. So in here, I have these um, different, eh, it's kind of working. I have these different columns in here, and it's basically, um, these are the parameters, and I have this area difference guy, and if you go in here, it's just program area minus area. So I have this difference. Now, area difference is a shared parameter, and as of 2017, Revit, mainly Autodesk, has given us the ability, I'm gonna close this, this is gonna get it. If you guys are wondering why my username is Michael Jordan, you'll find out here in just a second. But is it caught it? Some of you caught it. Some of you are like, is your username Michael Jordan? Are you related to Michael Jordan? No. Okay. In here, I have this room tag, and I have this ability as of just 2000, I believe 2017, where you can now um, put a calculated value in a tag. Now, this is awesome um, because in real time, when I'm in my project, I can actually start to. Um, I can start to use this as kind of like a working, uh, a working uh, view. Uh, I don't need my, don't think I need this anymore. I'm gonna close some of this stuff so I'm not flipping through it. It's gonna be problematic. People are gonna start getting dizzy. It's not gonna be good. Okay, so room tag. So in here, you can see I have program area, actual area, and then I have the difference. So like if I update this, this is updating in real time. So this is that workflow of being able to have a, a calculated value in a tag. You can now tag calculated values. Now every architecture person is going, sweet, this solves my, my issue with my code schedules. Nope, sorry, does not, um, still a limitation. Um, the reason is because for code schedules, typically you use a key schedule, and we're gonna talk about key schedules, appropriate and inappropriate uses, and still appropriate in my mind. Um, uses of that, can't do it. I'll talk about that another time. Um, but you, this does not solve your uh, code occupancy load issue. And I'll either send you guys a thing in the comments or show it on the next one just because of time. But it doesn't solve that, but it is useful for this. So with that, um, any questions, thoughts, or comments? Um, we do have one question from a little bit back. Um, is it possible to copy combined parameters? Copy combined parameters. So I, I think, oh, I know what you're talking about. I don't know. Um, there is a workflow. Uh, oh, man, I haven't done it for a long time, so this will be interesting. You now have the ability to combine parameters in Revit and 
I am trying to remember how you do that. Someone on there knows, and they're like, dude, it's, it's this tab and this thing. I have not done it for a while. Um, combined, it might be here. Combined parameters, there it is. Um, I don't know. Like you, we could bring those. Uh, let's let's. I just closed it. Um, I don't know if I didn't. Maybe I, maybe I didn't. Yeah, I closed it. Sorry. Um, I'll find out. Um, just because we have a lot of other content to go through, my gut tells me yes. I would think absolutely. I don't know why you wouldn't be able to, um, but I'm gonna say yes. You can. I would think you can do that. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So next, what I want to do this is this is another really cool one. Some of you, most of you guys will know this. Probably 60, 75 percent of you guys will be like, "Oh, I know that one." Um, but for those that you, you that have not done this, this blew my mind as well when I first found out about this. Okay. So um, I always create like a working schedule for my doors, so you can have a um, a printed door schedule, like a summary door schedule, and then I have like this working one. And my syntax is always like a working or some, you know, all uppercase or lowercase, whatever. So we'll just do this so you guys know it's working. Okay. Now, this is awesome. Okay. So let's say I have a hardware group. Now, uh, this is door schedule. I can go through and I can totally be like, oh, cool. Like this is door hardware group one. This is door hardware group two. I seriously, we worked on a project. It was a million square foot government project. And there were, I want to say somewhere to the tune of like 400 and 500 doors on that project. And this was like the process, right? Like managing all this data. Okay, so this is the wrong way to do it. Now, the cool way to do it, you guys ready? What you do, let me blow this up so you can see this magic, this black magic that is Revit. Okay, you can uncheck itemize every instance, say okay. And then I could say you are, let's say like 90% of my doors are hardware group one. I can do that and then I can go sorting and grouping and then itemize every instance and boom, like every single door I just filled in that parameter. And then let's say like like the last 10% or something, right, are a different, you know, hardware group. Then I could go through and do that. You can also filter, um, use your filter if it's like, hey, all the bathroom doors are this hardware type. You know, use your, your filter tool. Um, I'm not gonna get into this. This is not necessarily a hack, tip, or trick, um, but you could use filter to start filtering down and a little more strategically, surgically, method methodically going through and assigning those hardware groups. So that is the roll up schedule uh, workflow. Thoughts, comments on that? Not yet. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> Now, I'm gonna show you guys what everybody does wrong. I'm serious, like every single firm I've ever worked at or for has always done this wrong. And many of you have done this. You know you have, um, I've done it. Um, and it is crazy. And it's because it's not as intuitive um, for us. Let's do it, did I have some partition? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, okay, so we have some typical partition walls. This is this is cool. Okay, back into kind of like data management. I call this uh, the recycling rooms workflow. Okay, now this is just like supposed to be Revit 101. Maybe not 101, but I mean you should like if you're using Revit. Re maybe we need like a better way for someone to explain this. Um, that's why I'm here. So there is this process, and let's say like you as a designer are going through and you're dropping in rooms. By the way, the schedule workflow was for the MEP guy. Um, that is one example that transcends to multiple disciplines. You can use that in a lot of applications. Okay, most people, when they're designing um, a project, they have walls, they have rooms, and let's say I have office, and whatever, break room, and uh, conference room, okay? It's just for illustra illustrative purposes. Okay, now, in here, what I want to do is show you guys that when I place a room, there is this little drop down right here, okay? There's one of these, because I've already done this once today. I have one office in here, and I can, most people just hit new room. Like, again, the wrong way to do this, what most people do is they will grab this room, and they'll delete it, and they'll delete this, and then they'll delete that guy, and then they go to room, and then they just drop new rooms, and then they rename them. Don't do that. Do not do that. What you should do is when you place a room, you recycle the room. So now you can see when, I, when I've when i deleted those and I have this drop down, I have those same rooms and you can see that the data went along for the ride. So like if I'm rearranging or doing some different stuff, you can see 
that it's actually bringing that information out with it. The room number comes with it, the program area, all the data in there exists. Um, so recycle rooms, um, that one you may not get your mind blown, but a really good workflow a lot of people don't know exists. Um, it's also worth mentioning, when you delete this, this just popped up. What do most people do when that pops up? Ignore it. Ignore it. Yeah. That's why. A room was deleted from all model views, but it still remains in the project. So that's why, that's how we're recycling that room is because it still remains in the project. It just got removed from the floor plan. So pay attention to your warnings. Um, those are always there to help you. Okay. Recycling rooms. Can I keep going? Keep going, man. All right. Like it. All right. Oh, this was cool. Okay. Big shout out to Paul Alvin. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I saw this at, uh, um, I was doing a presentation in Omaha, Nebraska. Shout out to Omaha. Woo woo. Midwest guy, Kansas City. Woo woo. Casey. Yep. Midwest. Um, represent. Mm -hmm. um, so, was at the Revit Central States Workshop, which became the BIM Workshop. And Paul Alvin did this class. I was like, oh my gosh, this is cool. Um, it was Revit for Interiors. Um, so, shout out to Paul. Uh, but this is, okay, so the application is you want to assign a lot of parameters uh, to a type or an assembly. And you can use a key schedule for this. Um, so, the example I'll use is a room finish schedule. And I hate room finish schedules, by the way. Um, there's all kinds of issues like there's never four sides to four sides to a room. Uh, what if the building's orthogonal? Um, so I don't, not a big fan of like northeast, southwest. We can have an arm wrestling match or a beer over if you like those or don't like them. Um, but this is the workflow. So um, what I'm gonna do is I want to assign like a typical color to all of these uh, parameters. So I'm going to go to my schedule and I'm going to create, most people also don't know you can do this. This is going to be like some black magic to people. Okay, so room style. I Instead of saying schedule building components, I'm saying schedule keys. Okay, so blow this up, you can see schedule keys, not room style. All right, um, now I say okay. And what I'll do is I have the key name, but then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring over a bunch of those parameters that you guys just saw. So we have base finish, um, so you can read this, base finish, ceiling finish. Um, bear with me, wall finish, and I think there was a ceiling, oh, I got ceiling. Um, base, ceiling, wall, that's good enough for now, okay. Um, so we say okay, and it creates this key schedule. Now, watch this, okay. So I create a few data rows, an insert data row. And let's just say like one of these is office. All the offices are going to have a certain finish. All of the um, conference rooms um, are going to have a certain finish. And the common spaces, right, will have a certain finish, right? So offices are going to get base type one, um, ceiling type, you know, whatever. Uh, let's say two by two white, I don't care, uh, wall finish, PT1, okay? Um, it's typical. And then yeah, this is B2, B3, this is, you know, two by four white. Um, let's do all caps, that's proper, right? White, okay, hang with me, hang with me. I know it's data entry, don't get bored yet. Hang in there, guys. Um, we're gonna say JIP. Uh, and wall finish, uh, PT2 and PT3, okay? All right, now watch this, this is cool. All right, so finish that, and then you go to your room finish schedule, and the key name is that room style, okay? And so this is the key, no pun intended. Um, you go to your room schedule, and the key was room style. This is what we picked when we created it, was room style, all right? Um, and I'm going to put that, did I get it? Room style, room style, add it. Okay. And I'll show you guys where that came from again. Cause I think I, I glossed over kind of quick, but I'll show you. So when I went to schedules and picked on rooms, hang with me, hang with me. And I said schedule this is where it came up. So that's the key name, that's the parameter. So that room style is this guy. So you could call it Danny's fancy parameter, right? That will be your key parameter, all right? Now, watch this magic happen. 
Now that we filled out our keys, I can go through and assign like common and check this out. Like it's totally populating um, these with the parameters. So again, assigning parameters all the way across for these specific um, assemblies or room styles. Um, so when I found and came across this, I was like mind blown. This is so awesome. And so you can see I missed floor before, but you can see like it's populating these other parameters. So with that, um, love feedback on that one. Um, I'm going to keep going though because we got five minutes and I want to show one or two other workflows. Okay. And I'll say right now, if we don't get to your question, I know there's a few that we've had to skip. Um, by all means, sign up for our membership page on our website. Mm -hmm. um, and through there, you can go to our community forum or our Slack channel and ask any questions there. And one of us or someone else in the community will hopefully get back to you quickly. Totally. Okay, so quickly, you guys, Revit Purist hate this. Hate this workflow. I'm gonna get so many nasty grams for showing everybody this, it's ridiculous. So, everyone's ears just perked up by the way. They're like, oh, yeah. what is he gonna show us? What is this craziness? All right, so this is called the key schedule hack. Don't judge me, there are appropriate uses of this. Get off my back. All right, so what you do is you schedule something. I just showed you appropriate use of the key schedule. This is the inappropriate or intentionally misusing Revit workflow. Many of you guys know about this. But schedule something you're never, ever, ever going to schedule. Okay, for an architect, it might be pipe insulation or nurse call devices is the other one that gets abused a lot. So you make a, 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 a key schedule, and this time, doesn't matter. We're, we're going to call it, um, let's call it general notes, okay? Um, many people have wanted to use Revit kind of like Excel. And so you can kind of do this. It doesn't actually do any data or, or adding or subtracting, but okay. So I'm creating new parameters. Uh, parameter one, I don't care. I'm just going to do this really quick to show you guys. Uh, parameter one, and then uh, another parameter. Let's say, uh, I don't know. I don't even know at this point. Table, finish, or whatever. Um, table, uh, other data. You can use this for notes mainly. Let's use that example. Okay, so you now have this where you can create new rows. You can populate this with whatever data you want. Now, big caveat, this is not tied to anything in the model. This is why Revit purists hate this, and I understand the logic, I understand the reason, but you can put data in here, and data is data, and so there is this workflow where you can, you know, my fancy, information of whatever you want. And so there is this key schedule hack that exists. You use it for general notes. You can use it just for populating like a tabular data format. That is the application. How much? How many people are mad at me right now? I see that comment. Thing. Only, only Elaine. Oh, only Elaine. Okay. Um, other people have your back. <laughs> okay. Um, real quick, a question from uh, Margarita. Can you import data into key schedules using Dynamo? Absolutely. You absolutely can. Oh. We, okay, I, I can't share too much yet, but we are doing this with Boma right now. So keep a lookout on the membership. Um, check out our newsletter. Mac right now is literally working on this workflow. Yes, you can populate a key schedule with Dynamo. And so that is a valid point for those that are mad at me, is that you can use Dynamo to grab data from the Revit model and then populate a key schedule as a hack. So you actually have that data. Um, there is that latency that exists. It's not in real time, but you could use Dynamo to populate this, for example, I've done it with BOMA because you can't format the Revit schedules how BOMA wants to see them. So that is an application of that. Can you take data that's in Excel and bring it right into a key schedule using Dynamo? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. There you go. And then can you rehost elements that are orphaned using Dynamo? Um, yes, we've done that as well. All right. Yep, you can do that. I can't show it right now, but yes, you can do that. And uh, Mr. Clifton over at TestFit calls you a savage. Oh, thank you, sir. So. It is uh, well received. You are savage. You you are crushing it there. Check out TestFit. Shout out TestFit. Copyright trademark. TestFit is good stuff. Oh, we do need to talk about your parameter jammer trademark later. But okay. Yeah. I'll wait till I like the news to you after. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. It must be trademarked somewhere, I think, and someone else is using it. I'm guessing. That's great. That's great. Oh, dang it! All right. We'll have to. I we got to check the trademark and see how it first. Probably them. I'm guessing. Okay. Um, all right. Now, this one, okay, let's end with this. This is the cool one. Um, many people have been frustrated and wanted to lock down certain stuff inside of their project. And so I'm going to show how to do that. Many of you guys know about this. Some of you don't. Um, 
But there is this workflow to lock down information in a project um, using Worksit. So I've already given away the punchline. Some of you guys know where I'm going. So what I can do is I can say I have the username BIM admin, or I don't know, let's use Michael Jordan. Um, so you can be a borrower, or excuse me, yeah, uh, an owner. So what you do is you say, I own this work set, okay? Um, let me synchronize real quick. Um, and what, basically what you do is you change your username, which I'll show you guys how to do in just a second. Um, but I can grab a work set like my structural background. This is the best application I've seen of this. Um, is you grab a background like this, you check it out as Michael Jordan or Bat Bim Admin or Miley Cyrus or whoever your super secret hero is. Yeah, Brenda Merchant suggests Miley Cyrus. So. Okay. I so I totally played a trick on Brenda. I, I'm not gonna lie, I did this. So I did this to Brenda on my last day. We used to work together at HDR. And I played this trick on a project. I'm sorry, Brenda. Some people thought it was funnier than others, and I did use Miley Cyrus. Um, okay, so when you do this, it was funny to me. Okay, <laughs> Brenda was a little mad at me. Okay, so you don't relinquish, you keep ownership. Okay, and then you change your username here under options to whatever it is. Let's say Danny, I'm gonna be Danny today. Okay, and Danny goes and gets a new project, Reddit, here. Uh, dang it, dang it, where is it? Hacks, tips, and tricks. Here. Sorry, guys. Um, and we'll open this guy, create a new local. As this new user, um, you can see Michael Jordan has checked out that work set. I know we're right up at time. Bear with me, guys. Final stretch here. In here now, if someone tries to, and I had this, someone would inadvertently accidentally try to move this, and it yells at you that Michael Jordan um, owns the element and you can't do anything until he resaves, synchronizes, and relinquish. Um, so that is the last tip or trick. I'm gonna give a big, um, huge shout out, a big, um, if you guys are interested in any of this stuff, love this stuff, please subscribe to YouTube. But check out our website. We have a bunch of free content out there on our blog. I'm just gonna pull this up really quick. So if you guys go to our blog, we have free Dynamo scripts. We have free training videos. Um, we did one yesterday on AI, machine learning, uh, BIM for manufacturing, free Dynamo packages, auto elevating, um, using packing algorithms, auto assemblies for manufacturers. Guys, a ton of this stuff is free. Like go out there, grab it, check it out, sign up for our membership. Um, if you guys want a training on any of this stuff, please, please reach out. We're doing a ton of Dynamo workshops, ton of Revit trainings, template Im implementation, uh, Dynamo scripts for people. It's a shameless plug. If you guys please, if you enjoy this content, let's find some ways to team up. We really, really love, love our team and love you guys. And we love the opportunity to work together. So with that, we are at time. Is there any last comments that people? Um, last one, Brenda says, not cool. So, <laughs> I think that's about it. All right, on that note, if you guys are looking to play a trick on your office, work sets. <laughs> That's where it's at. There's, there's legitimate and illegitimate, which are also legitimate workflows. So with that, we've really enjoyed you guys. Um, thanks for chiming in today. We, this is recorded, and we will post it online. With that, enjoy the rest of your guys' day. Uh, we'll see you later. Yeah, thanks for joining. Bye-bye.